many of you guys, as, as I am, you know, seeing familiar faces out there, know that this is part of a series, and you guys have been here since uh, the days of uh, the Ranger, which was the first book that came out. The second book was Lost Ones, and this is the third book in that story. And this is kind of a um, evolution of, of the character of a guy named Quinn Colson, who essentially to me is not that much different from the old Western characters and the characters that we grew up with. I mean, in a lot of ways, he's like Shane, and he's Will Kane and High Noon, and he's that kind of iconic American hero. And just in this day and age, what I see mostly uh, as far as guys that I would really kind of fill, filling that role as far as being the classic American hero are the, are the people coming home from the front. From Iraq and Afghanistan, that's who Quinn Colson is. He's a U.S. Army Ranger. He's coming home to a small town. Like I said, the setup is pretty much like the Old West. And even going with that Old West theme even more, in the second book, he becomes sheriff of this uh, rural county in North Mississippi. And uh, the third book, he's having to deal with um, prison escapees, um, a preacher who's just recently gotten out of Parchman Prison, and uh, a really rough, tumble, uh, uh, awful storm that's headed their way. So these books, what they really allow me to do, and the fun for me writing these novels, is to keep that continuing story going. I really like writing about these people. I love this world. I love this story about Jericho, Mississippi. I like writing about the South, and let's face it, you know, part of part of my talk or a lot of my talk has has to do with explaining to people who are not from the South how weird Mississippi is. So that cuts about thirty minutes out of trying to explain to you guys, you know, what the, the weirdness is here. But it's it's a lot of fuel to write about. I mean, you can pick up copies of the Commercial Appeal or the Tupelo newspaper, and I mean, I have stuff in probably one or two editions to last me for ten or twelve books. <laughs> And uh, these are people that I know. I mean, I live in Oxford, Mississippi. Um, this county that I write about is not unlike counties that are surrounding Lafayette County. Uh, these people are not unlike the folks that Faulkner was writing about, you know, 60, 70 years ago. These are, these are the descendants. And these are um, just, to me, like I said, I mean, I love to write about real people and characters that we know, the ones that we see. And it's the same way for my hero. Uh, for Quinn Colson, I don't want him to be a Rambo. I don't want him to be a Jason Bourne type character. I want him to be like uh, the, the average U.S. soldier that's coming home from the front. I want him to be somebody that we all know, or maybe is a, you know a member of our families, uh, even down to the criminals. And when I was writing this book, I had the uh, I don't say I, don't, I was going to say honor and privilege, but I don't think that really is a terrible way to go to Parchman Prison. I don't think that, that really works. I had the, how about opportunity? Does that work better? Yeah, I had the opportunity to go to Parchman Prison. And, uh, you know, for me to write about this world, to get it, even though I live in this area, I've got to see this stuff to be able to bring it into your hands. And I like the idea when I read a book that it's got some authenticity to it, that you feel like the author knows what they're talking about, that they've taken the time to, to make sure that those things are right. Uh, so recently, <clears throat> at the end of last year, I uh, got to go to Parchman Prison, met up with the superintendent there, who was just terrific, very accommodating to me, opened up all kinds of avenues within the prison, because, you know, Parchman is, for those of you who may have spent time there unwillingly or, you know, or, or have had relatives there, it's, it's actually many different prisons within the complex. Uh, Parchman is, is the size of a county in Mississippi. And all the prisons that are there are pretty much in the center. And so if anyone was ever to leave one of those or, or escape, they have about 26 miles to go to get to some of those borders around in that prison. And it's a storied prison. Uh, it's got a, you know, uh, infamous history that goes back to after the Civil War. Uh, it had originally been a plantation, and then it became one of the most rough and tumble violent prisons as far as chain gangs, that kind of thing. Uh, around the turn of the century and beyond. And I wanted to write about that modern type of prison that it is today and kind of strip away the cliches of what we think about prisons, where we think about them with you know, each individual uh, prisoner that's in a cell and, and about the, the way that things work as far as socially. And I actually got to get around in uh, general confinement with these people. I got to hang out with them just like I'm talking to you guys. And uh, I got to go on, take a, even though my book doesn't deal with it, but I got to take a stroll upon death row, which was uh, 
that was a little freaky. That was a little freaky, you know, walking on death row and realizing why these people are there and where they're headed. And uh, as we were walking along, there was actually a guard that was with us that was holding up one of those riot shields that was holding it over us. And I thought, just ask her, I said, why, why are you doing, you know, why are you doing that? She said, in case anyone wants to stab you or spit on you. So that's the, that, those are the links that I'm willing to go for you guys to get that authenticity. <laughs> Meet those good people. But there was things that I learned that when I was there that I never figured, never really imagined. Most, most of the guards who work at Parchment are women. Um, the, the prisons that the, themselves, the actual individual units, are kind of pod units, and everyone kind of lives in a community environment. There are no cells. They kind of have bunk beds. Uh, a lot of the prisoners spend a lot of the time watching these small individual televisions. Uh, there is not um, a work detail forced upon anyone unless they want to actually work in some of those things that, that involve agriculture or, you know, shop work as far as taking care of cars or body work. And, um, but when I was there, what really interested me was that there was a program that was open to all prisoners that involved them getting out of parchment with a, uh, being, being, a, being able to be an ordained minister. And I thought, now that's very interesting. And you had prisoners that were looking at, um, you know, rehabilitation, but at the same time, you got to see that, they, you know, they had a, a total shot at, at absolute redemption as well. And I thought that was just fascinating, that anybody, no matter what your conviction was, what you were serving time for, the fact that you could come in there and you could walk out not only a free man, but a, an ordained minister. And so that's how the character who's in this, this novel, The Broken Places, Jamie Dixon comes about, is he has been um, uh, recently pardoned by the outgoing governor. And this was funny, you guys will appreciate this. I got a note from, or is a review of the book that ran somewhere. And in the review said, the book was totally authentic, believable, except for the fact that there would ever be a widespread pardon of uh, criminals in Mississippi in such a red, red state. They thought that completely rang false. That no, no governor in such a, a red state would ever have that happen. Um, but it is based on the Haley Barber pardon. And I thought it was interesting for somebody who had been convicted of murder to return to their small town and not only face the community there, but also have to face the family of the, the victim and how that would reception would be. So this guy, Jamie Dixon, comes out, comes into my, my county, Tibaha County, and he's trying to basically do a lot of good works. And I was not interested in writing about the, you know, the slick preachers that we've seen on television and the cliche of the, the guys with the slick suits and the hair and the, the televangelist kind of people. I wanted to write more about the, the hipper, kind of more interesting ministers that sometimes you're seeing today where the you know, it's not that awful praise music and that kind of stuff, but they like to listen to, you know, Johnny Cash, and they like to listen to good music. They try to really get in and, and, and work with the poor and do good works. So a lot of this book is dealing with um, whether Jamie D uh, Dixon's redemption is something that's authentic, or is he phony? Is he guilty? And if he is guilty, does it matter anymore? Is he truly redeemed? And that's so much of what this story is about. Uh, really the worst mistake this man makes uh, when he gets out of jail, first of all coming back home to, to Jericho, Mississippi, but also for him to start dating the sister of the sheriff, who is our hero, Quinn. And, uh, you know, you don't want to mess with a southern man's sister. That's just something you don't do. So that's the, uh, that's the beginnings of the story. Jamie has come home. Quinn, whose local hero, has now been elected sheriff. Uh, at the same time, there's a big breakout that happens at Parchman. Three inmates escape from Parchman, and uh, two of them head straight for Jericho looking for one of their friends who's been le recently pardoned. And uh, I had a ball writing this book, and it's so fun for me to bring this world to other readers because as it is familiar to all of us, as much as we know um, criminals, like you, Royal, I know how many criminals you know. <laughs> you used to introduce me to a few, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's just an interesting world, but this, uh, the South is, is such a mystery to people, and I think it's just riddled with a lot of cliches as far as in movies and books, and, and I just, uh, I love bringing this world because it's, it's dirty and it's gritty, but at the same time, it's beautiful and it's fun, and there's, there's terrific people and honorable people, and then there's dangerous people, and then there's hypocrites, and then there's some wonderfully moral people, so that's what I'm, I'm trying to put together in this book is a, is a fairly, um, 
uh, accurate patchwork of, of what the being in the deep south is like. So, how about how about a few questions while I sip on my beer so I can contemplate this as <laughs> as we're talking here? I, do you have? I, I got some question with you. Do you write one book at a time, or actually, you working on Spencer writing part of it and then breaking and writing part of? How many of you guys are, are Spencer fans? Read Spencer. All right. Um, it's a very, he was asking me about how different it is as far as, you know, can I work on both projects at the same time? And I cannot. I cannot. It's, it's like speaking two different languages. Because, you know, when Mr. Parker, for, for those, I don't know if you guys know, but I, I write this series of books with this character, Spencer, who uh, is in Boston. Um, he's an iconic character, iconic writer. Um, and he carried on three different series that he was writing simultaneously. One of them was a Western, one of them was about a sheriff that was in Massachusetts, but they all had that same voice. They were all very similar type books, even though there were different time periods, different places, different characters. The, the hard thing for me is I'm writing in two very distinct voices, and so I'm really writing in Spencer's voice or Robert B. Parker's voice, and then I've got to switch over to my own voice, and I've got to make sure that I keep those things you know, exclusive. And so in doing so, I cannot write both at the same time. I have got to, like right now I'm working on a Spencer book. And that Spencer book has to be completed, it has to be, you know, um, off my plate and moved on into production. And, you know, I might have to pick it up a little bit with edits or copy edits and that kind of thing, but I can't be thinking about it while I'm working on a Quinn book. And when I get into writing Quinn, I've got to come from a very different mindset. And I have different tricks that really help me with that. And a lot of it is for me is, is with music and I'm really on a certain diet of certain kind of music when I'm writing Spencer and then when I'm writing for Quinn and Mississippi you know I'm listening I go from jazz with Spencer to writing you know listening to Outlaw Country and listening to Waylon Jennings and Johnny Paycheck and you know, uh, Jamie Johnson and all that stuff so it's just a you know I always tell people I take pride that I speak both languages I can I can speak Yankee and I can speak Southern so I can do both. Do you have a total series? Mine because you had your character working out of New Orleans for several books. Different this man is one of the few people who remember those books. Yeah. 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 Do you really? Yeah. Signed. Wow. You're one of about eight. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm doing too, so. No, you're, you're ideal. Uh, so you, you worked on Spencer, and you wrote his books for, I guess, eight, nine years? It was, I started, I, I was really young when I started publishing. I, I got a book deal when I was 26, 27 years old. Thought I had it all figured out. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And um, I started the series where I had a character. And he essentially was very much like Spencer. I was, I've been a Robert Parker fan uh, since I was a teenager. And I essentially wanted to do what he did in Boston, only do it in the South. And so I had this character named Travers that lived in New Orleans. and got these adventures. It was fun books to write, but I really felt like there was a limited amount of books I could do with that character. And um, I learned a lot from being a very young writer about mistakes that you make. And, and one of them is having a character where there's a limited amount of story possibilities. And uh, for this one character when I was writing when I was young, I really felt like four books was about as far as I could take that character. I really didn't know what I could do without the stories becoming redundant you know, and, and not having something that was exciting for the reader each time. And the fun thing for me writing this series now is there's always somebody who can write, who can, who can walk in Spencer's door, be a new client, and there's always an infinite amount of possibilities and storylines in Boston. And the same thing in rural Mississippi with all the crazy stuff that happens there. You can always have, you know, you know just look in the paper with all the, the, the corruption and, uh, you know, um, family connections, all that stuff. So that's really what I tried to do with this new series is to give myself an opportunity as a storyteller to really open up that world and have a lot of stories to tell. And that's that's the fun thing for me. As so opposed you're going to stay in Mississippi in Jericho for a while. I think so, yeah. Yeah, it would be hard. I think that's what the story is about. The story is, you know, it is about Quinn, but it's also about his sister. It's also about his mother. Um, it's about his extended family. It's about the things that happened uh, even before he was born and his wayward father and it's uh, it really at the core of it it's a family drama is what the story is there is some action there's some violence but at the core of it it's really about the, the, the dynamics of having a southern family and so that's the that's the root of everything